Oh, it's interesting. God sure orchestrates things, doesn't he? He doesn't leave anything left to chance. Uh, the songs and Tony's scripture this morning prepared our hearts for the message today and the message I am calling, Fear Not, for I am with you always. And we're looking at Psalm 91, but we're going to take a look at a few other scriptures before we actually go there. I was, uh, I was moved, I guess it was last Sunday, I'm getting old so I forget when it was, but last Sunday we prayed together for worship, and my brother Scott prayed that we would not be afraid, that we are the ones that we with Christ have, we have the security, we have the, the understanding of who God is, and that if we're afraid, how then will the world that's around us that is in such great fear not be afraid? And that really struck me, and, and uh, Wednesday night we were I was going to teach again on uh, Ecclesiastes, because as I said before, that was one of my favorite books, and yet I couldn't get out of my head that prayer and those thoughts. And uh, I asked Laura Cotta to send me information on, what is it called, Group Me? Is that what it is? I didn't re realize it was all ladies <laughs> until I got on it. And uh, I loaded the app and I got on it and, and I let it give me the... Uh, what do they call it, the, the notifications? Well, I soon turned off the notifications. <laughs> it is like, I'm serious. This is a wonderful thing. The, you, you've got to know, if you have a prayer request, you need to send it to these ladies because they are in prayer all day long, communicating with one another. And like I said, it was like, <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Oh! Okay, okay, yeah, well, if you'll forgive me a, an anecdote, um, I was watching a movie, and the little girl was telling her daddy a, a bedtime story, because he couldn't think of any, and she said, once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess, and she had a red dress, and a blue dress, and a green dress, and a yellow dress, and a pink dress, and a purple dress. He goes, I know, she had a lot of dresses and lots of colors. Ladies, I am so, I can't tell you, I am so grateful. I read your prayers. I read your love for the congregation, your love for Jesus. I read about your love for God and your constancy of praying and seeking the Lord for my son, for those that are ill, yeah, I'm crying, uh, of, 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 it's really smoky in here, isn't it? <laughs> I am so grateful that we are in a church that teaches the word and nothing but the word, so help us the word. That we have a pastor who is committed to the word and nothing but the word. That we have a congregation of men and women who when you ask for prayer, won't just acknowledge that, yes, okay, I'll do that, but they actually do it. And I was privileged to see the depth and the drive that was there. If you have a prayer, I will guarantee you from what I know, just from one day listening to the app, that you are being prayed for. Your prayers, your requests are being lifted up to God. And they are humbly being lifted up by people who are fasting and praying and seeking God's face for you. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for... I'm reminded of the scriptures and the women that followed Christ and their love for him and their... just love for him. Their love for you. I pray you would bless them. I pray you would bless 
bless them beyond their wildest imaginations for their willingness and their desire to serve you and to cry out to you for others. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I heard somebody was on it. I just heard it. <laughs> Let's begin with a scripture, Isaiah 41.10. And I would encourage you to write these down as references because what we're going to talk about is not being afraid and the encouragement that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And for the next, for today and Wednesday night, this is what we're going to be looking at. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, New American Standard Bible reads, and this is God speaking through Isaiah. He says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you. Take this picture now. Don't anxiously, he's telling, do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely, I will help you. Surely, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There's the first promise that we should not worry and we should not fear. I heard someone say, the war against fear begins with repentance. And I thought that was kind of, that was interesting, because I thought the war against, against sin began with repentance. But the war against anything biblically begins with repentance. It begins with turning from our wicked ways, as 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, and calling upon the Lord and allowing Him to change our lives first so that fear and those issues don't exist. When, when, we have, when we have God in our lives, and He is the focus and attention of our lives, as Psalm 91 is going to tell us, then we are under His supervision. We are, we are shadowed by the Lord. And so I would say that the battle that we fight against being afraid begins with repentance, with turning to God fully and asking if there are things in our life that need to change. What is making me afraid? What am I afraid of? What is it that's there? So in Isaiah 41.10, God says, don't fear. There's no fear, no anxiety when you look around because the turmoil of life isn't going to affect you because God is there. Just got a message from Gabriel Contreras. Doing good. No anxiety when you look around and you see the turmoil of life. God declares that He is God. That is something we need to remember. You are God, and I rest in you. God declares that He is our strength. God declares that He will help us. In the term there, He will help us. Not, I might help you. I might find time for you, but I will help you. God declares that He will uphold us, that when you fall or prevent us from falling, He is there to give us a hand. And God declares that He will hold us up in His right hand. And if you understand, if you go back and look at the nuance of the, uh, in Hebrew, the right hand is the hand of friendship. The right hand is the man, it's the one you shake with. It's the one that gives, it's the one that, that has greater meaning, great meaning to you. And so he holds us up in his right hand. The Apostle John writes the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. He writes, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. 
So building this case in that why should we not fear is we belong to Christ, we hear his voice, and we are his sheep. We're fully Jesus is fully acquainted with you and I, our fears, our strengths, our weaknesses. He knows our faults and he knows our abilities. And in spite of all of that, he loved us so much that he died for us and that we are to follow him. And we follow him to eternal life. And that is this, to be the focus of our attention, not on the anxiety of the anxious things we see around us, but upon Christ and upon the eternal salvation that we have in him that we look forward to that time in eternity. Now, I, I, would, not, you, I would not want you to think that I believe that I'm cavalier at all in any of this that COVID or any of the things that happen in our lives aren't real and aren't devastating and aren't trying to kill us. They are. But that's not the focus. That focus will bring us to worry and fear. That focus will isolate us from people. That focus will, no matter how you feel about a mask, it will allow you to mask yourself from people and hide from people which is the very last thing that you want to do. We are to rejoice in times of trouble. Our confidence is in Christ. And he says, we will not perish. The word perish here, this is, a, I, I didn't realize this, but this is an interesting word. Perish, to perish means to be destroyed, but it is reference to punishment in hell. This word perish is to be destroyed, but it is reference to punishment in hell. Keep that in mind as you read that. It, it's, it's, it's used, the same word is used in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. When Matthew writes, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The same word. Matthew 18, 14 says, It is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish that they should spend eternity in hell. John chapter 3, 15, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, spend eternity and be punished in hell. So the, the, the point of Romans 12, 2, they who have sinned without the law shall perish without the law. So the word, the point I'm making here is this word means a future punishment that's coming and that is what God, and G, through Christ, has prevented us from happening. So the thing, we're not going to die, we're not going to perish. We are physically going to die, but those who have Christ, our hope and our joy and our peace is in the fact that we are in Christ, that salvation is there, and our focus is on the fact that we are not going to perish, that we are going to spend eternity with Christ and not spend eternity in hell. The declaration of our Savior is that his followers, true disciples, shall never be cast away. We're not going to be cast aside. The original language expresses it this way. They shall not be destroyed forever. That's what Jesus is saying. You shall not be destroyed forever. If you take it out of the literal, uh, the literal Greek is, they shall not be destroyed forever, forever. They shall not perish to eternity. So this is spoken to and of all Christians. We possess the character of Christ as followers of Christ as long as we are called and then are called part of his flock, aren't we? That's good news. That is good news, and that's the kind of news that we want because we, we know we're not going to perish. We know that life is eternal, whether we live life in hell eternally or we live life in heaven eternally. So therefore, I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of what? What do we have? We have power. We have something else. Love. And we have something else. A sound mind. So how does that all 
take place? How do I, how do I, where's power come from? The God whose son I am, right? The child, I am God's child. I am empowered by God for his good. Where does the love come from? Not, not lust. Love comes from the Father. It doesn't come from anything that I can make up. It comes from God. And my sound mind comes from having the mind of Christ because I am a Christian, because I am born into Christ. I have the mind of Christ, and I have a whole different view of seeing things than I've ever had before. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place, a shelter of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Watch these words. These are really, really powerful. Surely He shall deliver me, or thee, from the snares of the fowler. And from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night. Nor for the arrow that flies by day. Nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness. Nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, there shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling." For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, or the cobra, some of your Bibles may read. The young lion and the dragon shall you trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Did you notice there was a transition from one speaker to the next in the last part of that? So the psalmist is writing I'm, I'm going to pause here for a second I just got something from Kurt he asked us that we would continue to pray for uh, Gabriel's mom They're asking for continued prayer. It disappeared on me. I apologize. Father, we lift Gabe's mom to you. We cry out for her as they've asked for urgent prayer. We beseech you, Lord, for her health, for her healing, for her comfort. And we ask, Lord God, in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the last part of this, the last part of this is God speaking about what he will do. The first part is the psalmist speaking about what he believes God will do. And then he transitions as if God is speaking through him of what God will do. God promises to abide God promises all who abide under his covering. Verses 1 through 4, you shall be taken under the peculiar care of heaven. Watch this. Where is fear? You and I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, 
under the shadow of the Almighty. Verses 1 through 4, you shall be taken under the peculiar care of heaven. Verses 3, 5, and 6, you are to be delivered from the malice of the powers of darkness. Verses 7 and 8, you shall be preserved by a peculiar preservation from God himself. Verses 10 through 12, you shall be the charge of the holy angels. God is going to give charge of the angels, give us in the hands of the angels to watch over us. Verses 13, you shall triumph over your enemies. Verses 14 through 16, you shall be the special favorites of God himself. That ought to give us some encouragement. Verse 1 says, Who lives in the secret place of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of Shaddai, the Almighty. Almighty, most powerful. So we are living under this shadow. If you go back to, to verse 1, there's this shadow that's over us. There's this covering that covers us. And, you know, I've, I've taught this before. And I was reminded of the intense heat we have here in the valley. And how much shade is comforting to us when you're in the intensity of the heat of summer. And then you can get under the shade of a tree. So God's shade is that kind of protection. That in the heat of the battle, when things seem like they're lost, when, when it's too hot to stand, God covers us. And there is none greater covering. There is no greater covering. So the one who lives abides in or under the shadow of the Almighty. This means to sit comfortably, to dwell, to inhabit, to be at comfort, to be at ease, without worry, and to be relaxed. Trusting, resting, peacefully accepting the sovereignty of God. And this is not an acquiesced idea about God. It's a real, living active, I don't want to use the word sitting, but I'm going to have to because he's talking, the, the picture is you're actively, willfully remaining under the hand of God as he protects you. And that should give us great joy and no fear. Psalm 27, 5, watch this. For he hides me in a tabernacle. In the day of evil, he hides me. In a secret place of his tent, on a rock, he raises me up. So when things are bad, when there's trouble, God is there. He's hiding me. In my day of evil, he hides me. And then he lifts me up and places my feet upon a solid rock, the foundation. Psalm 31, verse 20. You have wrought for those trusting in you. Before sons of men, you hide them in the secret place of your presence from artifices or clever devices or cunning devices that are coming against you of man. You conceal them in a tabernacle from the strife of tongues. How about our government? Yes. Yes. How about our government? Anybody troubled? Anybody troubled with the last election? Maybe you're not. Doesn't matter. God's sovereign. We have who we have. The picture here is that when there's trouble, when these, when these clever, cunning devices come against us that Satan throws out there, that we're not to be troubled by those because we have God who watches over us. We have the angels who have been put in charge of protecting us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the thoughts I think toward you, God speaking, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Psalm 139, 16 through 17, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book, they are all written. Watch this. What's written? What is written? The days fashioned for me. It's already written. And when was it written? When yet there was none of them. 
How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. When you have that, we have that. We have this, this God who knew us before all things and already determined the number of days that we would live before there was even a single one of them. So where then, remember, I am not being cavalier. Where then is fear? Where is fear if God knows my numbers of my days? I can rest in that to note that, <clears throat> pardon me, I won't die a moment sooner than God has already ordained or stay around a moment longer than he's ordained. That gives us confidence and it gives us confidence in our prayers that we can say without unequivocally, thy will be done. This is what I want, Lord. And Pastor Bud and I were talking about this the other day, that we are allowed to ask God questions. We don't fault him for what he decides or fault him for the answers that are given. But don't you that have children allow your children to ask you questions? And when they are old enough to understand, you answer them. And you entrust them with wisdom. So when we ask of God, it's okay. He's not angry with us when we ask for healing or we ask for something. Why not ask God? Do we use it for our own pleasure? No. For the pleasure of the kingdom, yes. Matthew chapter 10, 29 through 31. He's going to talk about sparrows. He said, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So God is, God is counting the hairs on the back of my head that still are there. He's counting the sparrows. And he knows that not even a sparrow falls to the ground. Something that has little value. But God knows it. And he okays it before it happens. That should give us confidence. Nothing is going to affect me or come into my life that God hasn't allowed to come into my life. I may do stupid things because I'm stupid. It doesn't prevent me from doing... God allows me to be dumb if I want to be. And God allows me to be fearful if I want to be. But if I decide, as a Christian, to live under the hand of God, then my fears are to subside because I'm resting in Him and not resting in my own ideas and abilities like we learned in studying Ecclesiastes. In Romans chapter 8, 28 through 29, Paul writes, and we know, watch this, all things work together for good to those who love God. What's the... The, 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 the but there, if we love God. All things work together for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, knowing us beforehand, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's you and I are to be conformed to the image. If you know Christ, we are to be conformed to that image, and that image operated in fear? Was Jesus afraid? I don't think so. I don't see that anywhere in the scriptures. And we're to be conformed to that, aren't we? Verse 1 talks about a secret place. And the secret place is... I, have to, I want to share this story with you. The secret place of God is a place that's hidden... And a place of security. It's the most high, right? My youngest son, Jeff, when he was... I've shared this story with you before. But it reminds me of the secret place. Jeff is like... 
Jeff might, must be five years old because I think Ryan was eight or nine. So Jeff is either five or six. And Ryan is playing Pop Warner football in Southern California. It was his first year. And the coach is screaming. You know, Pop Warner coaches have this tendency of thinking everything's really important. And so they're screaming. Can anybody tackle this guy? What's wrong? And they hand the ball to this huge kid that's right at the edge of the weight. And he's running over kids. And all, I mean, he's leaving a wake of bodies behind him as he runs each time they hand him the ball. So instead of giving the ball to someone else, realizing that this kid weighs 280 and all these other guys are, are 47 pounds, they want him to answer, and he's screaming at all the kids. Can anybody tackle this guy? And I'm thinking, isn't this what's going on around us? Can anybody take care of this disease? What's going on? Out from behind his mother's leg, the secret place of his most high, runs little Jeff, and he's a pudgy little booger, and this kid's running by. He runs out there and grabs him by both legs, tackles him, knocks him down, gets up and runs and hides behind his mother's leg. He's hanging on his mom's leg like this. <laughs> and I thought, what a picture. What a picture. I hope that sticks in you. I mean, I can still see it because I'm a pop. But I see this. It's as, as all of a sudden, I'm standing on the side, and all of a sudden, I see this. And Jeff's not very fast, so it must have been slow motion. But he goes out, and he grabs, and he just, of course, the kid didn't see him coming. But he, he clocks this guy. And he gets up. He didn't do anything. He didn't dust himself off or go, you know. He runs around and gets behind his mom, grabs her leg, and he's looking like this. <laughs> That's the picture of being in the shadow of the Almighty, of grabbing a hold of the leg and looking around and then running out and doing what you're called to do and then getting back. Go do your duty. Go do what God has trained you to do. So here's the Most High, the, 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 the Almighty, the God that there is none greater. All the power that is, is in God Almighty, in this Shaddai. So there is no power greater than the power that you and I find ourselves under when we willingly come under the hand or under the shadow of the Almighty. We sit, literally sit in comfort, in protection of the most powerful being in the universe. Nothing can touch you unless it's ordained by Him. Nothing can touch you. Literally, he who is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, in the shade of the Almighty, lodges habitually in him. So, do I trust him? Verses 2 through 4 of Psalm 91. Do I trust God? Do I trust him? He is saying of Jehovah. This is the, the Young's literal translation. He is making a literal, so the words are a little out of order but I believe they make uh, sense here. He is saying of Jehovah, my refuge, my bulwark, my God, I trust in him. Write that down. Are you saying, are you saying, I want us to say, my refuge, my bulwark, my trust, my deliverer. You deliver from the snare of the fowler. From the calamitous pestilence, with his pinions, he covers us over, and under his wings do you trust. A shield and a buckler is his truth. God's truth becomes the shield and buckler that surrounds us. We're going to break down these words. You and I dwell living under the protection of the Most High. God is a refuge. What is a refuge? What is a refuge? See, I, 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 I needed to know this. I needed to know this, so I looked this up. Because I was troubled after my brother prayed that I was troubled, that I was fearful. I was finding myself thinking, 
Man, there's a lot of people sick. There are people dying. All this is coming down. And Lord, this is getting tough. I'm not real happy about what's going on. And that doesn't matter. But I needed to know. So I started looking. And I asked God, what does James say? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives a little bit. Liberally. Comes and pours the dump truck of wisdom on you. The full load. So you get all that you need. So I said, okay, Lord. He said, it's not Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. I said, I've taught that before. It's not about your teaching. It's about you sharing what I'm telling you. You're not teaching anybody anything. You're sharing what I'm telling you. You're afraid, and you've asked how to not be afraid anymore. Tell them that. You and I dwell. We live under the protection of the Most High. He is our refuge. It means a place of trust, a shelter from the storms of life, a stronghold and a protection. The next word is bulwark. God is my bulwark. It means a defensive wall, a mountain of strength, a fortification against all evil. He said that God is my God. And I, we accept God's rule over us. God is the one in whom we trust. God rules our lives. Thy will be done. Amen? Thy will be done. God's will be done. God is my deliverer. He delivers me from the entanglements, the snares that have been set for me. Who's setting snares? Anybody getting snared at all? Anybody troubled? by the circumstances of what's going on in life, about the numbers of people that are ill, about a disease that was created by man to destroy men, about governments, about lies. All of that's out there, and God delivers us from the entanglements of those entanglements and those snares because those entanglements and snares tear us away from the protection of the Most High as He covers us over in His shadows and the Almighty, the most powerful being of the world, is there protecting us. He is our covering. He is over us this way, protecting us. We're sheltered and protected. So God is my deliverer. He delivers me from the entanglements the ens that ensnares me. He delivers me from the hand of my enemy. He pulls me out of the snare when I fall into it, the net that's laid in wait for me. He removes me from the plague of destruction. Remember that word of destruction. Now, that's important because that was not about dying a physical death. That was about suffering forever in hell. He removes me from the plague of destruction, from the desires, the calamity, the ruin, the mischief, the perverse things that happen around me all day long. Calamitous disasters, the pestilences and the plagues, the diseases that can take my life. God is our refuge and hope in this. Fear is gone in Christ. God is for us and not against us. God is for our good and not for our evil. God is a... Have you seen a job site that, that has caution? They have fences around it, right? Big hole, equipment running. And what does it say? Caution. Gates are locked. Caution fence. That's what God is, a security fence that surrounds us so that he entwines us in himself. He hedges us in and he secures us. That's what that is talking about. The picture is this mother hen. If you've ever, my sister-in-law has a, small farm up in Springville, and she has lots of chickens. So we get lots of eggs. And you watch the mother, when they have chicks, she will actually go and gather them. She'll walk around with her wings, and she'll gather them if there's a storm. And she brings them in together, and she hides them under her wings, and she puts her head down and protects them. That's this picture of what God has done. 
I looked up uh, because he refers to an eagle of holding her chicks up on, on her wings. And I learned that eagles fly over their nests to clean them, and they fly over their nests to teach their little ones how to, how to fly. And the air, as they hover over the nest, the little ones open up their wings, and they start to feel the loft. And then as they get older, as the wind blows, they begin to open their arms, or their arms, their wings up, and they feel the lift. So little by little, they learn how to fly. And then I noted the most important thing. The eagles learn to fly. The eaglets learn to fly by watching their mother and father fly. And I thought, wow, that's not going to escape me. You and I learn from reading the scripture. We learn from prayer. We learn from God, from watching what God does and how he responds to things, how Jesus responded to things, and we are to be like him and respond in a like manner. So God takes full exposure of all the assaults that come upon us, <clears throat> protects us. We're under his protection, but we have to accept it. If you want to be without fear, then you're going to accept the protection of God and not run out on your own. So his truth... God's truth becomes my shield and my buckler, and it surrounds me. And the picture of a shield here, uh, if you've seen the Roman soldiers, they had a, sol a, a shield that they fought with. It was on the arm and then a short knife, and that was for close combat. Have you seen what they had that was in front of them when they were being attacked by horses and, and whatnot? They had this full body shield, and they would place that into the ground, and that protected them completely from any assault. And that's the shield. That's God's truth. His word is our truth. And it is our shield. It is our buckler for us. In Psalm 91, verses 5 through 8, we're going to close with this. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not approach you. You only will look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. So we can see that there's a, the point here is we're looking at the wickedness, at, at wicked men and wicked people. And that destruction that lays waste at noonday, all of these things are not going to come near us because fear is gone when we are willing and habitually, remember that word, habitually to live under the shadow of the Almighty. No fear of any principality or power or any other created thing, according to Romans 8.33. No fear of any created thing, of a principality, no fear of COVID, of sickness or disease, of death that, that walks in darkness, that is, is exacerbated by the dark and the fear of what's there. When, when you and I go about our day, I know Becky and I were talking about this this morning, and we think, gosh, we need to be careful. We need to be careful where we go. Don't want to get around a lot of crowds of people that, what might happen? This is the arrow that flies by day. We don't know what's coming, and the idea here is you step off the curb, you've looked both ways, and you get hit by a bus. Why oh, you weren't careful? Well, you know what? If a sparrow falls to the earth with God's permission, then whatever happens to me is by God's permission. And that I am tucked away, I am secure. That the arrow that flies by the day will find its mark because God has allowed it to find the mark. Not because I inadvertently stepped off the curb at the wrong time or I went to the wrong place. Yes, we need to be careful. Yes, we need to be clean. Yes, we need to do the right things, always. But God equips us through his Holy Spirit and through, the, through his word that we would grow in him. And we'll close with 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. That the word of God was our buckler and our shield and our peace and our security. And as we live under the shadow of the Almighty, under this 
umbrella that God has provided for us. The, the most powerful being in the entire universe has covered you and me. And a bird won't, fly, won't fall to death without him knowing it first and approving it. So you and I, no matter what, you and I can rest. We can be so profound in God's word and so not fearful, not cavalier, to throw things off all restraints, but to prayerfully seek God and to live in his way through his word that nothing, nothing will touch me without God's hand approving it. And if he approves it, then I'm for it. The book of James, phenomenal dealing with that. Verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture, not part, not some, not a little bit, each, every, all, everything. In Hebrew, hakol. In Spanish, I believe, todo. <laughs> is that right? Or is that, is that the little... Little dog. You're right. You're right, okay. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it's divinely inspired. It's God breathed. And it is profitable for doctrine, how I go about, how I live, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. Father, thank you that we are thoroughly furnished for all good works, that you have placed your hand over us, that you are the umbrella of protection. You are the most powerful being that has always been and will always be. You are the I am. And we worship you and praise you. Lord, I pray for my own heart that when fear approaches, that I would recognize, no, I live under the shadow of the Almighty and you protect me. Nothing, nothing, not one single solitary thing will touch us unless you allow it because you watch over us. And we praise you and we thank you. I pray for this body. We pray, Lord, for those that are sick. We ask again, Lord, for your healing. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you're teaching all of us all the time to be more and more like Christ. And we give you all the honor and all the praise. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, let's